begin by reading a text that will uh, be central in what we're looking at uh, this evening. One where um, Jesus again points to the evidence that He is who He says He is, not expecting those who come to Him to just simply accept it because He says it, but rather He shows what we're looking at, His divine credentials. So what I'd like to do is read uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 12 through 23. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bears came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Notice, first of all, the connection between the miracle Jesus did and the fact that they recognized him as a prophet. Notice, secondly, because I didn't include this in the sermon, but it just struck me, that the miracle that was done here was one that was obvious that everyone could see and struck fear in the hearts of those who saw it. It was clearly a miracle, okay? Uh, that's very important because miracles have evidential power, but to have evidential power, they have to be seen, okay? Well, the, this one was undeniable, okay? Well, this report concerning him went out uh, all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things, Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? Now, you wouldn't expect that question from John, would you? Because he's the one who, uh, was, who went out to prepare the way for the Messiah and who identified him when he showed up for baptism. And now he's having questions. Again, it shows us that, that John was human or it's possible that he sent these men to question Jesus so that they would know with certainty. When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Notice Jesus didn't just say, yes. <laughs> but he said, look at the evidence and then tell John what you've seen. Okay, so again, the evidence, very important. When it comes to identifying who Jesus is, authenticating him as a messenger from God. He doesn't just say, take my word for it. I mean, I'm the son of God. You should listen to me. But he says, look at what I'm doing. You know, no one can do this. Nicodemus came to him at night, remember, and said, no one can do the things you do unless they are sent from God. Okay, so let's, again, just do some quick review. So far, we've seen that God reveals himself in the creation. Okay, God shows us that he is. He shows us what he's like. He shows us what he wants. Again, conscience. And, of course, because of the conviction of conscience, he also shows us that we have failed to do what he wants and that we are under his judgment. Paul says that what God reveals in nature is enough to leave everyone without excuse. Now, again, the reason that we do apologetics, the reason that we need to point these things that we're studying out to others is not because there's not enough evidence. You know, everyone's already without excuse. The reason is because of what Paul says that the unbeliever does with the evidence. They, because of their sinful hearts, they try to hide it and cover over it so that they can live the way they want to live, you know, not with uh, basically facing judgment and feeling guilty about everything they do, but rather just being able to enjoy their sin. Well, apologetics are really meant to tear down the walls that they have built against the knowledge of God that is revealed in the creation. Now, these arguments are not going to convert anyone. 
but they will make them concerned, perhaps concerned enough to seek after the Lord. Okay, with the Spirit's blessing, these arguments, he can use these arguments to awaken them, which simply means to make them concerned about their states, you know, bring them again face to face with God so they understand their guilt that may cause them to seek after him and by God's grace perhaps become the means to their conversion, which means we don't just give them the arguments, we also give them the gospel, but the arguments are meant to prove that the gospel is in fact the message sent from God and the only way of salvation. So that's the purpose of the apologetics. And, and by the way, realizing that God has given his own perfect apologetic, okay, in the creation, we should pray that the Lord would cause that revelation to really press down on the minds and the hearts of everyone we know that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time, I think I've told you before probably several times, every time I was tempted to doubt the truth of, of, of what we read in Scripture, I would just, again, open the door and look outside. God's apologetic is so powerful, you just can't deny it. Well, we need to pray that, that God would, if, you know, again, show our children, our neighbors, uh, everyone, uh, that He is. And again, these things that they can see through the creation that they might wake up to their need of the Lord Jesus Christ and be open to the gospel. Okay, so secondly, we've seen that as we present an argument, as we're going to um, try to argue for the truth of the Bible ultimately, we do need to start where God has started, and that is with His existence in the creation. Before we attempt to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, Rather than trying to prove the Bible is the Word of God and then using the Bible to prove that God exists, okay, that's, that's the tack that R.C. Sproul recommended to us, and the reason being is because most critics of the Bible reject it because it says that God exists, okay, because they assume their, their presupposition, their assumption is there is no God, all this came about by accident, and Evolution can explain everything. Uh, if you have material and enough time, anything can happen. So we first need to prove that God exists so that we can, well, so that there is a possibility of, of miracles and there is the possibility of a word from God. So they can't just deny it out of hand, you know, when we try to show them from the Scripture. Now, last week we saw that it's important that, and by the way, we've already shown that God does exist, so we start there. But last week we also saw it was important that the Bible actually make the claim that it is God's Word. As R.C. reminded us, <coughs> excuse me, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any sense in trying to demonstrate something that the Bible itself didn't, didn't claim to be, right? So it's important to see that it does claim to be the Word of God, and we saw that it does in five ways. Now, I wanted to review this because it may have been confusing to some, because what I was doing was showing that the Bible does make that claim, but I wanted to try to extend that to everything that was in the Bible. So we spent a little bit of time connecting the dots, okay? Uh, so we saw, first of all, that Jesus clearly tells us the entire Old Testament is God's Word. Remember when he says, Scripture cannot be broken. And by Scripture, he's referring to the same thing the Jews referred to by Scripture, which was the Old Testament writings, what's called, you know, the, the law and the prophets and the writings. Um, who, you know, the Jews believe that to be from God. Um, Jesus was saying the Scripture cannot be broken. And what he meant by that is it can't be set aside. It cannot fail to be true. It cannot fail to come to pass, and the reason is because Scripture is God's Word, okay? So Jesus clearly is claiming that the Bible, the Old Testament at least, is God's Word. And now I said Paul also made that claim, all Scripture is inspired by God, and that certainly included the Old Testament. Now secondly, Jesus claimed that He was speaking God's Word, okay? So He claims the Old Testament is God's Word, that, that takes care of the first 39 books, but what about the New Testament? Well, Jesus says, first of all, that He's speaking God's Word. He says in John 12, verses 48 and 49, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. 
The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. So Jesus is saying everything that he says, he is saying at the commandment of his Father. And of course, he's my Father, he says, is, is God, Yahweh, covenant God of Israel. And we could go more into depth there. I mean, Jesus himself is as well, but um, certainly Jesus is saying the Father has commanded him every word that he speaks. So every word he speaks is the word of God. So the Old Testament is the word of God. What Jesus says is the word of God. Thirdly, Jesus promised to give his apostles his spirit so that they could write down what he said. Remember it, write it down, and explain it. Jesus says in John 14, verse 29, or 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, that would include Gospels, that would include the writings of Paul and Peter and John. Okay, so Jesus says the Old Testament's the Word of God. He says, what I, says, what I say is the Word of God. He says to his apostles, I've given you this, the Spirit so that you can remember and write these things down and explain them. Fourthly, he says that he promised that the Spirit would show them the things that were coming, okay, prophetic visions. Uh, John 16, verse 13, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Now, we know that the New Testament letters contain prophetic writings about end times. We know that the book of Revelation in its entirety is about that. John wrote that, and, and the apostles wrote the other things that have to do with prophecy. Jesus is saying, that's from the Spirit. That is the Word of God. Okay, and then finally, we considered the books that this seems to have left out, okay? And even though I included all the Gospels in Jesus' promise, you know, I, I do need to back up and say, well, Mark and Luke, okay, Mark and Luke were not apostles. So we have Mark's Gospel, we have Luke's Gospel, we have the book of Acts that Luke also wrote, we have Hebrews, we have James and Jude, and none of these were apostles, but even though they weren't written by apostles, we need to remember that each of these men were close associates. Each of these authors were close associates with apostles, okay? Which means that these books were written with their approval because they were written in their lifetime. You know, I'm sure that Paul would have spoken out against what Luke wrote if he saw something in it that he thought was inaccurate, okay? Well, Mark was a close associate of Peter. Peter lived while that was written, Luke, and the author of Hebrews were associates of Paul. And James and Jude, if you remember who they were, they, they weren't really associates of any of the 12, but they were the half-brothers of Christ, <laughs> okay? So Christ is called the apostle, the great apostle of, of our faith. So we'd say, yes, they too were also associates of an apostle. Now, backing up a little bit, remember Jesus is really the author of the entire Bible. Didn't he say that um, he would give his spirit and it wasn't the Old Testament written by the Spirit of God? And isn't that spirit the Spirit of Christ? Isn't he the Logos, the Word of God? See, it was through his spirit that all these things were written. So Jesus claims that the Bible is, is his word. Now, one thing we need to note at this point is that all of these arguments hinge on one thing, okay? They hinge on the testimony of Jesus, what he claimed regarding the Old Testament, what he claimed regarding his own words, what he claimed regarding what the apostles would write by the Spirit and their close associates. So the next question we need to ask is, how can we demonstrate that Jesus was right when he said the things that he said about the Old Testament himself and, and the apostles. Well, we know as Christians subjectively because of the Spirit's internal testimony, okay, because of the Spirit's illuminating work, and we're going to get to that as we get down the road here after we establish Scripture. We want to build really the whole uh, 
you know, teaching of the Bible on itself. The Spirit of God, as the Westminster Assembly tells us in the confession they wrote, the Spirit of God gives to us a full persuasion that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, so we know. But how are we going to show it to other people? You should believe it because I believe it. Well, that, that's not going to be very convincing. So how can we show it objectively to others? Well, what we need to be able to do is to show them Jesus' credentials, you know, his divine credentials, that God authorized him to speak on his behalf. And the way we've already seen that God does that is through miracles. He enables those who speak for him to do things only he can do. Remember the effect that Jesus' miracles had and, and every miracle in Scripture. It was, it was astonishing. It was amazing. It filled people with wonder and, and awe and fear. It stopped traffic and made people listen. Same thing happened you know, on the day of Pentecost, remember? When the Spirit descended in the way that He did with the tongues of fire, mighty rushing wind, the, the apostles speaking in languages that that everybody who had gathered to Jerusalem for Pentecost understood and they heard them speaking about the wonderful works of God in their own language and they said, what does this mean? Well, that, that, that whole event was meant to be a witness to the Jews and it was meant to gather them together so that they would listen to the sermon that Peter was going to preach as he preached to them about Jesus Christ. So miracles authenticate the messenger, and it made on, on this particular occasion Peter's message very powerful, and as we know, many thousands were converted. Now, in our passage, Jesus, excuse me, John sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus really this very question, are you the expected one, or should we look for someone else? How do we know that you are sent from God? And I've already noted that Jesus did not answer them directly. He didn't say, well, you should tell them, I, yes, I say that I am, you know. But instead, he points to the evidence. He points to the, uh, to the, um, the evidence that the Father gives to him, the, the credentials his Father has given to him in the miracles that he had done. He says, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now again, in the meditation that I read earlier, Jesus essentially did the same thing to prove to the Jews in Jerusalem that he was who he claimed to be. Let me read a little bit more fully that passage in John 5, 33 through 36. He says, you have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth, but the testimony which I receive is not from man. But I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So notice to the two disciples sent by John and to the Jews in Jerusalem, Jesus points to his works to prove that he is sent from God. You know, when you stop and think about it, you know, John the Baptist didn't actually perform any miracles. The testimony that God gives to his son is much greater than that which he gave to John and also greater than John's testimony about Jesus. The father is testifying that Jesus is, this, well, he is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Now, his works, his miracles actually prove two things that he was sent by God, which is what we've been looking at, but also that he was the Messiah. Because some of the miracles that are listed here are things that only the Messiah would, would do. Now that quote, when Jesus points to this, he doesn't point to one Old Testament quote. He actually brings in several passages from Isaiah. And they're passages that are showing what Messiah would do. Uh, but some of these things that he would do were done for the first time in history. Okay, in the Old Testament, we certainly have rec a record of a leper being cleansed. If I were to ask you who that was, would you be able to tell me? Okay, well, it's, it's Naaman, okay? And Naaman wasn't even a Jew. <laughs> he was a, a Syrian. Uh, uh, so Jesus tells us in Luke 4.27, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, 
And none of them were cleansed, or none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And by the way, that was meant to be a rebuke to Israel. Uh, there may have been other times when, when lepers were cleansed, but we have no record of it, okay? So it may be that he was the only one. Now, we also have a record of three people being raised from the dead in the Old Testament. Elijah raised the son of the widow of Zarephath. Elisha raised the Shunammite woman's son. And a man was raised from the dead when his carcass was thrown into the grave of Elisha and touched his bones. I think that's one of the most intriguing um, uh, you know, uh, passages or accounts in, in Scripture. So three people were raised from the dead. So that, that's not unique. And neither was the, the leper being cleansed. But were there any blind that received their sight? You know, the man that Jesus healed, the one who was born blind, when he was asked by the Pharisees, who healed you? He said, I don't know. But I do know this, that since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. <clears throat> one of the things Jesus emphasized to the messengers from John, John the Baptist, was that the blind receive sight. Okay, that, that's very uh, important because that's something the Scripture said Messiah would do. We also don't read of any of the lame walking in the Old Testament. We don't read of any of the deaf hearing. And these two were things that only Messiah would do so that when he appeared, they could identify who he was. Okay. So Jesus, by his miracles, shows that he is not only a messenger sent from God, he's actually showing us that he is the Messiah. Now, we'll come back to the importance of that in just a moment. The next question we need to look at, and the question will likely be asked as we show somebody the, this evidence, okay, is how do we know that what the Bible says about what Jesus did is actually true? How do we know he really performed these miracles? How do we know the church didn't just make it up, as, as uh, liberals believe, you know, after the Enlightenment, uh, they, they had to try to explain how the Bible came about apart from God, because they didn't believe God communicated, if there was a God at all. I think many of them still believe that God existed, such as um, Immanuel Kant, you know, who is the one who really erected the wall that blocked at least philosophy and much of the church that embraced it from the knowledge of God, by saying God is in a realm that we can never really know because we can't see Him we, we, and perceive Him with our senses. So we don't know that this Bible actually came from Him. So how did it come about? Well, you know, the church, they had this Messiah that they thought was the Messiah and they began to embellish His life with all these different miracles and they just made it all up. Okay, so how do we answer somebody like that? Well, that's, again, why R.C. Sproul, first of all, said we need to begin with God's existence, okay? If God didn't exist, well, if God didn't exist, there couldn't be anything, right? But if God didn't exist, there certainly could not be miracles. But if He exists, miracles are possible. So you can't rule out the Bible on the basis of the fact that it contains an account of Jesus doing miracles, but, again, how do we demonstrate that Jesus actually did these things? Well, that's where R.C.'s question uh, became important. He asked this question, does the Bible have to be the Word of God to be a reliable record of what actually took place in those days? The answer to that question is no. Okay? It doesn't have to be the Word of God for it to record the truth. Because if that were the case, then we couldn't trust anything that anybody wrote that wasn't written by God himself. Now, realize that we don't look at man's writings the way we look at God's writings. We know that what God writes is infallible. What man writes is fallible. But the fact is, man can write reliable history. They can get things right. If they couldn't, then how could you prove or disprove? that George Washington lived, that he was the first president of the United States. How could you prove Hitler did what he did, you know, to Europe and uh, all, you know, just the entire World War situation and Stalin and so forth? Well, men wrote about these things apart from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they got a lot of it true, didn't they? Um, 
the Bible doesn't have to be inspired to contain the truth. Okay, now that, that's a very important principle. So in other words, when we begin this argument, we don't have to begin with the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, but we begin with the fact that it is reliable history. Now, how do we know that it's reliable history? Okay, well, here's where we have to do a little bit of work. Now, in the Old Testament, God laid down a rule to establish the trustworthiness of any testimony. He said in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. You know, now that's the way Old Testament justice was. If, if somebody was going to be convicted, there had to be at least two witnesses that spoke against him. And if they both agreed, their testimony would be accepted. Uh, Jesus applied the same principle in the matter of church discipline. In Matthew 18, remember he says this, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Okay, so the way that God says any, any truth, the truth of any statement is confirmed is by the mouth of two or three witnesses. And you would think that because of the wisdom of that, that we would continue to do that today. I was doing some research to see if that was still, if that was still the case, but I found out it isn't. One person's testimony is enough to convict anyone of any crime if the jury believes that that witness is beyond any reasonable doubt. That's, that can be kind of scary. Well, the fact is God didn't give us just one witness, but he gave us many witnesses. We have many eyewitness testimonies to what Jesus did. Matthew wrote an eyewitness account. That's what his gospel is all about. John did the same thing as well. They were both with Jesus during the time of his ministry. They heard him. They saw what he did. Matthew, oh, excuse me, uh, Mark recorded Peter's eyewitness account. Remember, he's the close associate. Where did Mark get his information? He got it from Peter. It's believed that Mark is really Peter's gospel. Peter also wrote his testimony in his letters. Luke tells us that he interviewed those who actually saw what Jesus did and heard what he said. There were many people who saw Jesus die on the cross and many people who saw him alive after his resurrection. And we have their accounts also included. Mary saw him, the two on the road to Emmaus, the eleven. Uh, Luke tells us, and actually Paul tells us, there were 500 who saw Jesus at the same time, you know, alive after he had been crucified. Remember that after he rose from the dead, he was on the earth for 40 days before he ascended. So there were a lot of people who saw him. And let's not forget that on the cross, we have John's testimony that a soldier rammed his spear through his side and blood and water came out. It was demonstrative evidence that Jesus was actually, he had actually expired. And we also have the testimony of the, the men who came to break his legs. They didn't break his legs to fulfill scripture that not a bone of him would be broken, but they didn't break his legs because he was already dead. Okay, so he was dead, but he was raised from the dead and many people saw him. And I should add this too, the people who claimed to have seen him also laid down their lives for this claim. They gave their lives for something which, if it had been a fabrication, it wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense that you would die for something you knew not to be true. So all of these things were recorded. By the way, I should mention one more. He did appear to Paul as well after his ascension on the road to Damascus. Now, all of these things are recorded by those who saw them so that we would have a record of these events for all time. You know, it, it has been argued, some people would say, well, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. I want to see a miracle. I want God to prove it to me. But the fact is, there are events that take place once in history, such as the death and resurrection of Christ, that can't be repeated. You know, we can't apply the scientific method to everything, which means that, you know, I, I can repeat it and I can examine it and I can see the relationship between these different things. Well, Jesus died once, he rose once from the dead. How are we going to demonstrate that that actually took place? 
to everyone's satisfaction if they have to see it to believe it. You know, it, it, well, there's no way that God could do that because that can only happen only, you know, once. And so what he did was he recorded it through several eyewitnesses who saw it. And again, we, we realize the Holy Spirit's also involved in this, and he's the one who brings this truth home. But we're talking about objectively, how can we demonstrate this? Okay, so he gave us this record of these one-time events. Now, how can, we, how can we show that this record is accurate? Now, that's where R.C. Sproul brought in archaeology. Okay, now there are things that the Bible records that aren't repeatable, things that we can't necessarily prove using the scientific method. He hasn't left behind evidence for us to examine. How can you prove that an angel exists? Well, R.C. said, well, you know, if there were some petrified angel wings laying around, maybe we could look at those and, and we could examine them. Or maybe the body of Christ, if, if he was still walking around on earth, we could use that to prove the resurrection. But the, th the fact is we can't because those things were not left behind. You know, Jesus is in heaven. The angels, of course, don't have material wings. They are spiritual beings, and there aren't going to be petrified angel wings because angels don't die and they're not physical. So how can we then demonstrate the truth of things that we can't prove? Well, the thing is we, we can't, but what we can do is we can show that there are things that are recorded in the Bible that are still around that we can look at and we can examine whether there's an accurate record of those things or not, enough to show us that the Bible is a reliable record of history. Now, again, we're talking about an area where we just can't go out and, uh, you know, travel around the world and, and look at this evidence ourselves and compare it to what the Bible says. I think, you know, there, there's a point at which we have to trust the testimony of other people. Right? And NRC pointed out you know, exactly that same thing. We don't have the time. We don't have the training. We don't have the expertise. We can't go out and prove it. The same thing you know, in many other areas. How do you know that your body is made up of trillions of cells? Have you discovered that for yourself? Have you seen it? Well, no. You, you trust the, the scientists who are doing the examination. How do you know the, the DNA has all this information encoded on it? Because the experts have, have seen it. They've mapped it. They know it. Okay? We haven't done that for ourselves, but we trust the experts. Well, we have to do the same thing here. So let me give to you a couple of quotes from two well-respected scholars, one who studied the Old Testament history and another who studied the New Testament, who affirmed to us that what the Bible records in those areas that we can check it, fact check it, is, is accurate. Now, the first is from William F. Albright, um, who was um, an Old Testament scholar of the highest rank. In his article titled History, Archaeology, and Christian Humanism, he says this, Thanks to modern research, we now recognize the Bible's substantial historicity. The narratives of the patriarchs, of Moses, and the Exodus, of the conquest of Canaan, or, or of the judges, the monarchy, exile, and restoration have all been confirmed and illustrated to an extent that I should have thought impossible 40 years ago. Now, this is important because we know that there are biblical critics who will deny the history of the Bible, who will claim that it wasn't written in the time frame in which they say it was written, that it was written by other authors. But here is one scholar who um, was very well respected who said the evidence is clear, the history is accurate. So he tells us the reliability of the Old Testament as a historical document is established. Now the second is that of Sir William Ramsey. And this is contained, uh, the quotes are contained in what I think is a very entertaining narrative that Stephen Nichols gives. Um, in one of, his, one of the segments of what's called Five Minutes in Church History, um, you can access that on Ligonier's website, and this is a transcription of, of what he says. But he talks about the journey of Sir William Ramsey, who began as a skeptic of the New Testament, basically buying into the liberal school, but through his own studies, basically tracing the footsteps of, of uh, Paul, 
according to Luke, discovered that Luke, as a matter of fact, was an excellent historian. So he writes this, uh, Stephen Nichols. In academic circles, the prevailing thought of the day regarding the New Testament, including the authorship of the books of the New Testament, was dominated by the work of Ferdinand Christian Bauer. His school was called the Tübingen School of Thought and Interpretation. Ramsey initially fell in with this group, which believed that most of Paul's epistles were not written by Paul. Perhaps only four were written by Paul. They believed most of the New Testament came much later, sometime in the second half of the second century. These academics thought the, the book of Acts in particular was written much later. They were very suspicious of the book of Acts. In one of Ramsey's books, which is primarily about Paul's travels as recorded in the book of Acts, Ramsey writes, I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation without any prejudice in favor of the conclusion, which I shall now attempt to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable to it, for the ingenuity and apparent completeness of the Tubingham theory had at one time quite convinced me. The Tubingen theory had convinced Ramsey that Acts was a second century composition. And by his own admission, he never relied on the book of Acts to give him any reliable report or evidence. But after years of investigating every single detail, of retracing places mentioned in Acts, and looking at all of the authorities, Ramsey came to the exact opposite conclusion. He came to the conclusion that not only was Luke a great historian, but that Luke was among the historians of first rank. Ramsey said the first and essential quality of the great historian is truth. What he says must be trustworthy. And he found Luke to be one of the most, if not the most, trustworthy historians of the ancient world. Ramsey found that Luke's accounts as recorded in both the gospel and in the sequel to the gospel, the book of Acts, to be trustworthy and true. For his efforts, Sir William Ramsey was knighted, even though he turned the entire academic scholarly community on its head when he transitioned from the higher critical view of the New Testament to accepting its truthfulness. Among his many books is St. Paul the Traveler and Roman Citizen. There you can find his recordings and all of the conclusions of his life of discovery as a scholar. Now, you see, again, we can't prove on, on our own examination and authority, but we can point to the, to the scholars, to the experts, to prove this point. R.C. tells us in his Defending the Faith that at no time in church history has the historic reliability of the Old Testament and the New Testament been as well established and verified as today. I forget who it was, it may have been Sir William Ramsey, who said that if you, can, if you can prove any inaccuracy in the history of the Bible, I will give you X amount of money. I think he made a, a cash prize. And no one was ever able to claim that prize because they could not prove that any of the history was false. Again and again, I think R.C. said this, every time the archaeologist puts his spade in the soil and turns it over, another fact of the Bible is confirmed. The Bible is reliable history. So we can trust what it records. And if we can, you know, verify from the things we can verify by looking at archaeology, there's no reason to doubt also the eyewitness testimonies were recorded accurately in Scripture. And again, there wasn't just one. It's not like, oh, I saw this man rise from the dead. I saw all these things and just one person is saying it. But we have hundreds of testimonies written down that Jesus did miracles and that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. So this is the way the argument then proceeds. You know, the argument in a nutshell, the Bible is reliable history. It's a reliable historical document that records for us several eyewitnesses, or eyewitness accounts, I should say, of Jesus doing miracles, even being raised from the dead, which proves that he was sent from God as a spokesman, that he's a true prophet. Now, certain of the miracles that he did prove that he was the Messiah, okay, whom the Old Testament prophets said 
would be God in our nature. Now, R.C. didn't use that argument, but I think we can use that because the, the, the miracles Jesus did prove He's the Messiah. And the Messiah, according to Old Testament prophecy, was going to be more than a man. Think Isaiah 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, clearly the Messiah. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, when you add to that what R.C. also argued, that Jesus as prophet sent from God also plainly tells us that he is God in the flesh, we should listen to him. Remember he said to the Jews in John 8, 58, when he said, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said, you're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham. You know, he lived quite a lot, you know, long time before him. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay, now he's claiming eternality. He's using the covenant name of God. That's what Yahweh literally means. I am the one who is eternal. Okay. So he claims to be God, and being that he has divine credentials from God, and being that he is the Messiah, God in our nature, we should listen to him. If anyone has the authority to tell us that the Bible is more than an historic, reliable document, but is in fact God's word, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is God in our nature. Now, that is the argument, okay, the main argument that R.C. Sproul used and John Gerstner used, an objective argument to show that the Bible is the Word of God. I think it, it really is a quite compelling argument, but there's a lot more than this, which we're going to look at, not tonight, but in, in the future, uh, which R.C. listed for us, not the least of which, of course, was fulfilled prophecy. Um, and we're going to look at that or begin to look at some of these things next Lord's Day evening. Okay, But for now, let's just bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's just again thank the Lord that we have access to so much information regarding uh, all these things to confirm to us, if we need further confirmation, that the Bible is the Word of God and that gives to us you know, the arguments we need to show it to others.